Greetings and good morning. This is Pastor Amos C. Brown, Senior Pastor of the Historic Third Baptist Church of San Francisco, California. It is our privilege, joy, and delight to again welcome you to Sunday School Time. We are located at 1399 McAllister Street here in the city and county of San Francisco. We trust that you will tell someone about our time of study, of serious focus and reflections on the Word of God. Our teacher is Dr. Jonathan Butler. At the organ is Reverend James Parrish Smith, our minister of music and church organist. He is accompanied by Reverend Sid Smith, who will be leading us in our Sunday School hymn, More, More About Jesus. This is our theme song, More, More About Only Jesus. And if the church community, if that faith community that claims to be Christians but only follow the mandates, the manner, the message, and the mystique of Jesus, we would indeed bring to this earth peace, joy, love, justice, and mercy. So let us all now join in singing our opening hymn. And as we sing this hymn, let me ask you, to contact your friends, your neighbors, your associates, and invite them to call in if they don't have the means of live stream. Our number is 510-925-1974. Once again, if you wish to be a part of our Sunday school time, call 510 510- 925-1974. And if you do that, our superintendent, Sister Marie Bushrod, would be ecstatic and very much pleased that you join us. Would I know more of his grace to others show more of his saving fullness see more of his love who died for me more more about Jesus more more about Jesus more of his saving fullness see more of his love who died for me more about jesus let me learn more of his holy will discern spirit of god my teacher be showing the things of christ to me more more about jesus more more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus in his word, holding communion with my Lord, hearing his voice in every line, making each faith saying mine more more about Jesus more more about Jesus more of his saving fullness see more of his love who died for me
without Jesus on his throne, riches and glory all his own. Marvelous kingdom sure increase, more of his coming, Prince of Peace. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus. again for another day that you have given us. We pray, O oh God, in this moment, in this time that we have to share in your word, we pray, O oh God, that you would give to us knowledge and wisdom, that you would share with us insights on what it is that we should do for the weeks to come. We thank you, O oh God, for our superintendent, Sister Marie Bushrod, and all the teachers who study every week. Thank you, O oh God, for those who have come together just to get to know more and more about you. We pray, O oh God, that the insights that we gain here, the knowledge, the wisdom, we pray, O oh God, it be a blessing to us and that you get the glory out of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, good morning to everyone who gathers around their devices as we study together using our live stream platform to God be the glory for this opportunity and the ability to be able to still share in the God's word together with each other. And we pray that God will give to us again insights onto what it is that we should do, what it is that God has called us to do for the weeks and the months to come. We are living in um, obviously uncertain times, trying times. And the text tells us, don't grow weary in well-doing, but in due season you will reap if you faint not. And we praise God that even in we're, as we are approaching this fall season, that God gives to us a fifth season called due season. And if we wait on that due season, God will give us what it is that we need. As we journey in our Sunday school lessons, we have began a series of lessons on God's provision, and we're concluding that series of lessons on God's provision, which is found in the book of Exodus. We first began with God's provision by, to the people of Israel. God provided the people of Israel with manna and quail. God provided them water from a rock. From a rock. And then last week we begin a series, or, or continue the series rather, uh, God gives victory over the Amalekites. Remember, the people of Israel are on their way to Mount Sinai. And as they are journeying through Mount Sinai, they're experiencing wilderness, uh, moments in the wilderness. And as we have tagged this series of lessons, mummerings in the wilderness, we move now to Exodus. This is at the end of their journey um, before they get to Mount Sinai. And it's found in uh, Exodus chapter 18, verses 13 through 26. Again, Exodus chapter 18, verses 13 to 26. That is the lesson for today. And the lesson title, God provides judges to help Moses. God provides judges uh, to help Moses. Again, God provides judges to help Moses. And it's found in Exodus chapter 18, beginning in verse number 13. So if you would flip over to Exodus chapter 18, beginning in verse 13, we will begin in our study on this today's lesson. Now, for those who may have joined for the first time, just to give you a recap that what has been taking place over the last 
uh, several Sundays, Moses has led the people out of Egypt, and so they are now on their way to Mount Sinai. As we recall in our lessons, we have gone through phases. Phase one, the people are uh, they're at the Red Sea. We know that decision of Pharaoh, he decided he wants to follow up. He didn't want, he regrets the decision to free Israel. And then the people wanted to give up. Great fear and anger, the Israelites, they cry out to Moses. And they said that our Egyptian slavery was far better than dying out here in the wilderness. And so Moses declares to them, don't give up, but look to God. Don't be afraid, just stand where you are and watch God rescue you. And so then God lifts him up. Moses is told to raise his staff and over the Red Sea and dividing the waters and allowing Israel to walk across on dry ground. So now in phase two, Israel crosses the Red Sea and they're led by a pillar of cloud. It moves between Egypt, the Egyptians and the Israelites. And at night it becomes a pillar of fire. Uh, once again, result in the darkness for Egyptians, but light for the Israelites. And so a strong wind blows and parts the Red Sea, forming the walls of the water on each side. And so attempting to pursue the Israelites across the dry path, the Egyptians, now they drown when Moses, is, Moses lifts his hand uh, and causes the water to collapse on them. And so we go on to phase three. They're traveling, and after traveling for three days uh, without finding water, the people discover this oasis of, of, at uh, Moriah, and the Lord uh, tells Moses to throw a tree in the water and because the water was bitter and undrinkable. And so obeying God, we learn, uh, will result in God's uh, protection from the diseases that were particularly inflicted on the Egyptians. And then we move to phase four. The oasis has the 12 springs and 70 palm trees. And as we have journeyed in our lessons, we have um, uh, gone deeply into uh, phase five and phase six. Israel is at the Sin Desert. Israel is at Rephidim. And last week, we, um, it, we learned that Joshua leads the Israelites' army to victory over the the, um, the Amalekites, as Moses prays for them from uh, on a hill, and Aaron and her assist Moses, and he holds up the staff uh, during the battle. And so we have now approached um, this, or continuing in our journey to Mount Sinai, the people of Israel, we're walking with them as they are traveling to Mount Sinai, and before they get there, we are going to see what happens in Exodus, again, Exodus chapter 18, beginning with verse number 13. So if you would flip over there to Exodus chapter 18, and we will begin in our reading with chapter 13, but we will give context uh, beginning with verse number 1. Chapter 13, 18, uh, verse number 13 of Exodus, the next day, Moses sat as a judge for the people, while the people stood around him from morning until evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is it? What is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone while all the people stand around you from morning until evening? And Moses said to his father, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me and I will decide between one person and another. And I make known to them the statutes and instructions of God. Moses' father-in-law said to him, what you are doing is not good. You will surely wear yourself out, both you and these people with you, for the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me. I will give you counsel and God be with you. You should represent the people before God and you should bring their cases before God. Teach them the statutes and instructions and make known to them the way 
they are to go and the things they are to do. You should also look for able men among all the people, men who fear God, are trustworthy, and hate dishonest gain. Set such men over them as officers over a thousand, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Let them sit as judges for the people at all times. Let them bring every important case to you, but decide every minor case for themselves. So it will be easier for you and that, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, verse number 23, if you do this and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure and all these people will go out to their home in peace. Again, I've read to you uh, Exodus chapter 18, beginning with verse number 13. So this chapter, I'm beginning with verse number 13 and, and concluding with verse number 26. This chapter is concerning Moses himself and also uh, his relationship or the affairs with his own family. And so chapter 18, beginning with verse 1, begins with Jethro, who is, has heard all these things that the Lord has done, how God has provided for the people of Israel. And he comes now, as Moses um, is there, comes to inquire, inform himself, uh, to rejoice with them as one uh, that had a true respect for both the people of Israel and God. Now, the interesting thing about Jethro, who he was a Midianite. He was a Midianite. So it was, uh, but so he was not to share with them the promised land. Yet, he rejoiced in their deliverance. And that's a good note for us. Oftentimes, we should make the comfort of others our own, as one writer would suggest, by taking pleasure as God does in the prosperity and the victories of others. Oftentimes, we look, up, we look down up on those that are victorious or whom are blessed, but, but this, um, this, this uh, sort of act of Jethro, as a Midianite who had never experienced uh, this promised land, he became rejoiceful. And he rejoiced in their comfort, in, their, in the way in which God gave the people of Israel provisions. So, what did Jethro do? He brought Moses' wife and his children to him. Um, and the text in verse number 3 and verse number 4, they play, pay particular attention to Moses' sons. They name him. His eldest son was named Gershom which means a stranger. Um, Moses designing not only a memorial of his own condition, but a communication to his son in this naming of his condition that we are all strangers upon earth as all fathers were. And then he named the text in verse four, it tells of his second son, the other Eleazar, uh, which is my God, a help. And as we translate it, it looks back to um, his deliverance from Pharaoh when he made an escape after the slaying of the Egyptians or the, the Lord is my help is another way of translating Eleazar and, and will deliver me. And so when we are taking a difficult service for God in our generation, it is good for us to encourage ourselves in God as our help, that the Lord is our help. And that is in, found in Moses' son's name, Eleazar. Uh, he that has delivered, one who has delivered us and will deliver us. So that is, that takes place in the first few verses of uh, chapter number 18. And so then we begin with verse number seven, and it begins with this kind greeting, the kind greeting that took place between Moses and his father-in-law, Jethro. Though Moses was a prophet of the Lord, a great prophet, he showed a very humble, humble respect uh, to his father-in-law, Jethro, for although Moses was promoted, although he was elevated, uh, he still gave honor to whom honor is due. He never looked uh, with disregard upon Jethro, but he 
honored him. He respected him. And that is another point that I want to make that those that stand in the favor of God are not discharged from the duty they owe to men and women. Moses went out to meet Jethro. He did homage to him. That's what the text says and kissed him. He respected him. And one writer, one commentator would say that religion does not destroy good manners. Okay, this is so this in this greeting and ex exchange between Moses and Jethro, Moses gives to him respect, gives to him honor where honor is due. Even the kind greetings that pass between them are taken notice of even in this text as expression and improvements of mutual love and friendship and respect. And so no matter who they are, no matter uh, how Moses is promoted or elevated, he humbled himself and respected his father-in-law, Jethro. Now, the narrative that Moses gave his father-in-law of the great things that God had done for Israel is found there in verse eight, number 8. So, uh, after he greets him, respects him, he gives him all the good news that has taken place. And this was one thing that Jethro came for, to know more fully, and particularly what he had heard from all the other people. And that's a good point as well for us to take into consideration is that communication concerning what God has done for us, what God has done for you, God's wondrous works is good conversation. Talking about what the Lord has done for you, how the Lord has brought you over, is not only good conversation, uh, station, but it takes notice of how you view God's providence in your life and the functions and the trends of that providence in all of our situations. This is the conversation that Moses had with his father-in-law. It was one uh, that um, obviously was uh, respected, but also Moses told him of God's good works, that God has done so much for the people of Israel. And when we are communicating with folks we know that God has done wondrous works in our lives and that is what we should communicate one with another. That is good conversation because God has been just that good. And so as a consequence of Moses communicating all of this, good, the good work, God's provision for the people of Israel, how does Jethro respond? He congratulates God's Israel. Jethro, in verse 9, it says that Jethro rejoice he not only rejoiced in the honor that was due to his son-in-law but in all the goodness done to israel while the israelites themselves as you know were murmuring despite all god's goodness to them here is a midianite one who would never experience this promised land but rejoice anyway those who stood by were more you know, Jethro and, 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 and this Midianite who stood by was more affected with the favors of God had shown to Israel than those that actually had received it. And we don't want to ever be in that position where those are more excited about God's blessings than you are. So we have to be rejoiceful in what the Lord has done and tell the good news, tell the good works of what the Lord has done for us. Because thus far, the Lord has helped us. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. He gave the glory to Israel's God. He says in verse 10, Blessed be Jehovah who have delivered you, Moses and Aaron, out of the hand of Pharaoh, said that, that, that he designed, uh, though he designed your death, he could not effect it. And by your ministry, he has delivered the people. And that is uh, the response that Jethro gives. Whatever, when, whatever we have the joy of, God must get the glory out of it, that God must get the praise of. And so when we experience joy in our lives, we must be careful to make sure that we give God the praise for it. And so Jethro's, as a consequence of this conversation that he had with, with, um, with, um, with Moses, uh, Jethro's faith was confirmed, and it took his moment to make a profession of it. He says in verse 11, now I know the Lord is greater than all of these other gods. That this was a this this matter of his faith that God of Israel 
was greater than all of those pretenders, all of those false and counterfeit gods. But now Jethro knew that this was, this was, in fact, the one who was greater than all of these other gods. And so this was a matter of his faith. And then it was a confirmation and improvement of his faith. When he says, now I know, he knew it before, but now he knew it better. His faith moved to a, a full assurance that this is God's doing. Now, having been assigned to redeem Israel out of bondage, he is employed now, Moses that is, as a lawgiver. He is employed now as a judge among the people of Israel. And he was, uh, as, as we have read in verse 13 now, he has been assigned to redeem Israel out of their bondage. He was to now answer their inquiries, to answer their questions. He was to consider a judge to explain to them. As a judge, he was to explain to them the will of God in doubtful cases and explain the laws of God explain the laws of God that were already given to them. And so they came now to Moses. Remember, they were murmuring and they were crying out to Moses, wishing they, that, that they would stay in, in bondage. And Moses is bringing them out through God. And now they are, are taking their inquiries to, to Moses. And his Moses' business was not to, to make the laws, but to make known God's laws. His place was but of that of a servant in this matter. He was to decide the controversies and to determine um, what was right and what was wrong. And if the people were as confrontational uh, as they were with God, no doubt that they had great uh, 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 sort of issues or inquiries to bring to Moses. So when a quarrel happened in Egypt, Moses had to be the one to reconcile the contenders. And they asked, who made thee a prince and a judge? But in, in the past, that's what they would ask. But now it was a uh, past dispute that God had made Moses the one. They humbly attended uh, to him um, and they began to bring forth their inquiries. Then Moses was called to, and now he is appeared to, to, to be the judge. And what does Moses do in verse number 13? With great consideration, uh, he was called to do this, 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 uh, this work, to be a judge. And one thing that I wanted to highlight was even in his posture, that the, that the text says that he sat to judge. He was composed, he was sedate. Uh, that he sat down and he sat down to hear uh, the folks inquiries and that's sometimes what we must do as leaders as those who are, are with the people that we must sit down and listen to the inquiries of the people and as uh, so he he sat down while the people in verse 14 said that they stood up that he was uh, he was able to be, he was accessible rather, and he was able to sit down and listen to the people's inquiries. He was able to listen to the people's inquiries with great faithfulness and closeness of application. So though Jethro, as Moses was listening to the inquiries of the people, Jethro was with him, his father-in-law was with him, and he he sat even the next day after his coming from morning to evening is when what the text says. So Moses sat, he listened, the people stood, you know, he, they were, uh, Moses was accessible to them. They provided their concerns and Moses sat and listened, the text says, from morning to evening. And though Moses was elevated to be the judge over all of Israel, he did not take his cases and throw upon others the burden of care and business. No, this is what he did. He instead, he sat from morning to even. And though the people had been provoking to him and were ready to stone him, even in, in chapter 17, as we know, yet he still made himself to be available and accessible to the people and to sit there and listen to their inquiries. People may fail in their duty to you, but as a leader, we must understand that we must not neglect 
uh, ours to them. And so no matter what people do to you, even as a follower of Christ, we must sit there and we must um, not neglect what God has called us to do for them. And so though Moses was well in his years, he kept to his business from morning and to night and made his meat and drink to do it. God gave him great strength, both in body and mind, which enabled him to go through a great deal of work with ease and pleasure, even in his latter years, and for the encouragement of others to spend and to be spent in the service of God, it proved that after all his labor, his natural force was to be now diminished. Those that wait on the Lord in his service, you know, the text says, show renew their strength and God gives us strength yes to do the work even in our latter parts of the year that we can do still we still have service a service a service to give to God a service to give to people and God will strengthen us to do that but as we will find out that is not exactly the best thing all the time that the great um, friend and Jethro, his father-in-law, the text says that he disliked this method that, that Moses had, that Moses took and was so free with him as to tell him that he disliked this method. It's found in verse number 14 where it reads here in verse number 14 when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing to the people, he said, what is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone? Well, all the people stand around you in the morning. In verse number 17, he further explains why he didn't like this method. And he says, what are you doing? What you are doing is not good. Verse number 18, why is it? You will surely wear yourself out. That word, that sort of phrase meaning really to crumble away, that you will stress yourself out, that, that this is not uh, this doesn't make good sense that you will uh, sort of wear yourself down if you continue to do uh, this all by yourself. He thought it was too much business for Moses to undertake alone and that it would be to the detriment, that it would be a detriment to his health and to great, too great a, a fatigue to him, that it would stress him out. And we know uh, when we all experience stress in our lives, and those things stress us out, it impacts us, not only our, our mental state, but also our physical state and our emotional and spiritual state as well, that we cannot do it alone. That's what Jethro explains to Moses, that he is, does not like this method, that it is not good. There may be overdoing, even in well-doing. You want to do well, but it still can be times where you have to uh, step back Jethro didn't like this method, even though Moses was uh, trying to act out all of his all of his duty, all of his service to the people. Um, Jethro said, "No, this is not a good method." And he gave to to Moses great wisdom, and wisdom is profitable in these types of situations. That we may never do less than we can, nor overtask ourselves with more than we ought to do. Let me just say that again, that we may, we should never do less than we can, but we also should never overtask ourselves to do more than we ought to do. And that is essentially what Jethro is passing down uh, to Moses. And he advised him to take a different model, take a different approach, that when we experience uh, great strain and all the work that we are doing, we often need to take a different approach. What is that approach? He says that, you know, that he should reserve to himself applications to God. This is in verse 19. He says, represent the people before God and you shall bring their cases before God. Also, whatever concern the whole con congregation in, in general uh, has, it must pass through you. But there's a big but in verse number 20 that, that yes, Moses should take on some of the inquiries of the people uh, and all the big cases, if you will, should go to him. But that Jethro suggests this new model that he should appoint judges in the several tribes and families who should try causes 
between person and person. In other words, uh, you know, they should do uh, those things that are not so big, not so great, light work. Every great matter they should bring to Moses, but those things that are not so as great, those should go to the judges. And so, so Jethro adds though, you know, yes, you should select those persons who can do this light work, if you will, but there are qualifications that one must have when they do this work. In verse number 21, it says that great care should be taken in the choice of these persons who should be admitted into this trust, that they may be able persons. That was the requisite for, for being a good judge, a person of the very best character. Now you, Moses, yes, you need to take on the inquiries, but assign those other inquiries to judges, but they must have some qualifications. Men and women of good sense, that was one of them, that understood business, that would not be intimidated by frowns and uproars, clear heads, courageous hearts, those are the ones that make good judgment. Judges. Those judges should fear God as believe that there is a God that is above them, whose eye is upon them, to whom they are accountable. Those persons that they, 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 they are thorough, that they think before they act. What other characteristics should a good judge have, a leader have? one who helps the leader, persons of truth with integrity and honest, whose words one may take, who's dependable, one they can rely upon. One who would not tell a lie, betray a trust. What are the other characteristics? Not only one that is, it says, one that is noble and generous, uh, and generous contempt of worldly wealth. Not only one that is not seeking bribes, nor aiming to rich enrich themselves, but hating even the thought of it. He or she then is fit to be a judge who hates the gain of the oppressors and shakes his hand from holding bribes. This is the characteristic of a good judge. And the text ends, if thou should do this thing, select these types of judges with this type of character, as God command you, this is what Jethro says, that if God responds this way, that God will see it through, that God will give great benefit to the people as a consequence of Moses lighting this load for him to lead the people to a better future. You hit a central core target matter. Right now it's all in the air, all on the waves of television right. and the radio choosing a judge right and the question for us as students moment for us to be engaged is to raise the question what does the Lord require of us as we have the critical responsibility of choosing judges do we choose judges who are recommended by a president who lies over 20,000 times and yet Jesus of Nazareth said you shall know the truth and the truth shall do what? Set you free. Our nation has been enslaved to too many lies, gaslighting. So let's make this thing corporate. Let's make it Political engagement, yes, nothing wrong with that. And our students must understand 
That whole lesson is not about an individual. This individualism that we have let creep into Christianity, our followers of Jesus, is antithetical to the Old Testament reality. Jews always moved as a group. Jesus had 12 disciples, a group. Now, this stuff of being an individual by oneself, and that's your only reality, came from the secular, social mind of Rome. And this Western rugged individualism has hit America in which people don't care about anyone else. They take the attitude, I got mine, now you get yours. That was not the reality in ancient Israel. They even corporately were guilty. They were corporately held accountable and responsible to God for the sins of the people, the whole family, the whole nation. So when you got to that point, I could not resist saying this is where Rubber meets the road. What are we going to be doing if we claim we are followers of God? Not of Connell, but of God. And if we're followers of God, we will do what? According to Micah, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. And then the other point that's in there that our students should be engaged with is the fact that though Jethro told Moses to get these people to help him, but your help must be qualified. You can't have folks who are subordinates around you who are not disciplined enough to get trained, who are not trustworthy, who will not do the task right. Why? Because down in Mississippi, that old saying was always uttered. You all heard me say it. If a task is once begun, never leave it till it's done. Be the labor, great or small. Do it well or not at all. And even Moses had problems in his own family with, with uh, Aaron and with Miriam. We'll get to that later on. But there ought to be a constant principle, a universal yardstick that we are measured by. And that is to do justice, love mercy, or go humbly with one's God. You got to have those kinds of people around you. Go ahead, Doc. Amen. I think that's a good note to, to end on, Pastor. Just to hear the, the wise words of Jethro when he says that we cannot do this work alone. That we must, we need each other, but we need those who will take the time to discipline themselves to be good learners and to do good work, act in integrity, and to know that God is the one who works through us, through all of us, to do this work. And so not one person can, can go to the ballot box, but we all have to go together. We all have to go to ensure that this, this yet to be United States will begin to be united. Amen. And God bless you on this morning. Thank you, Dr. Butler, for that excellent exposition of our Sunday school lesson. And again, we would like to thank all of our teachers who have been out there in the field connecting with the church membership. And we trust that during this pandemic, we will still be connected with each other through technology, such as the phone, the internet, or even paying a safe visit to do a wellness check on everyone. In my robot call, that's what I ask of the members of the fellowship. And we've done a great job thus far along the way. 
in terms of giving and in terms of looking after the welfare of others. So thank you, Dr. Butler, and thank our staff, Brother Tony, Sister Daphne, and Sister Christina. And now we will segue into our 10 o'clock worship.